These are chapter 30 to 32 to the end of the book. And welcome back, chapter 30. At 3 p.m. today, I would walk into Harold's office and, as he had described it, re-enter the system. I would remember nothing of this time after I was reborn. There was no way I'd miss this meeting, so I was going to head in at 1 p.m. and sit there waiting. I grabbed the keys to the Honda and headed out. I walked out my front door and almost instantaneously, the guards appeared in front of me and a doorway to a a center block room opened up. I pulled back just in time to avoid stepping through it, but wasn't prepared for the push at my back. I stumbled through into the room with no doors. And for the first time since I entered this crazy new reality, no one needed to explain a thing. I knew with an undeniable clarity what had just happened. Someone had just screwed me over. I sat with my back against the center block wall as I stared at my phone that had service. I called the door guard number several times even though I knew it was hopeless. The only thing that didn't make sense was who? Harold wanted me gone. Fate had wanted me gone before I even joined. The guy trying to recruit me was dead, but perhaps someone he worked with. No, I couldn't get the guards on the phone. It had to be someone directly involved with the agency, but why would they want to keep me? It just didn't make sense. Everyone with a say wanted me gone. I looked down at my phone, four o'clock. My window had officially closed. I'd be here for another thousand years, minus one month served. I felt beaten down and defeated. It was an altogether new experience for me and one I never wanted to feel again. I wanted to cry. I should have, but the tears simply didn't come. Maybe I shed too many already. Was it possible to run out? That's how I felt, hollow, like there was nothing left to give. Finally, in the middle of my small cubicle, the door appeared. I grabbed my purse and my phone as I slowly stood I looked at both the guards. Why? They hung their heads and then the one on the right uttered a single name, Patty. I walked out to my condo, leaving the center block room and a small chunk of humanity I had left with it. I walked into the office like I was now doomed to do for countless years to come. The sole purpose of my existence in the world was now dull on death and pain. I was hardly in a party and mood when I saw the cake with the words, welcome to the club, scrawled across it. But I tried to smile for the people who were at least trying to attempt to embrace me. It was a little late, but I'd take hold of the olive olive branch with both hands. Even Harold was there, not exactly smiling but I've learned that was a rare occurrence. So you're officially one of us, Murphy said, handing me a slice of cake. We're going to be besties, Lux said, as she came to stand on my other side. I'm so glad you're staying. Kitty just really wasn't very good female companionship. First thing we're doing Monday is going to Nordstrom, my treat. Do you get raises? I asked, knowing I'd never be able to shop there on what what I was getting. No, Harold's a real cheapo. You just forget who you're talking to. Couple trips to Vegas with me and we'll have you fixed up real good. Oh, at least I wouldn't have to live on hot dogs forever. Somebody turned the radio on and jacked the volume all the way up on one headlight by Wallflowers while Crow handed out glasses of heavy spiked punch. And then fate was there. All conversations stopped making the radio seem especially loud. Kitty tried to hand him a piece of cake, but he declined without saying a word. His eyes scanned the room until they settled on me. He didn't come closer or say anything, just stared at me for a moment while I stared back. No one spoke. Finally, after the moments stretched on past uncomfortable to almost unbearable, 
He shook his head and walked out. What's his problem? Who does that? I heard one of the jinx say after fate was well out of hearing. Someone pour shots, Luck called from behind my left shoulder. We need to get this party going. Everybody, everyone resumed eating, but the mood had been lost. I stayed until the, the little party died out, and then I walked out, of, out to my Honda and faced the reality of my future. Wait up. I turned to see Luck running out towards me. Where are you going? The comp home. No, not tonight. She hooked an arm in mine and pulled out her phone and called up a door. So far, you've only seen the bad side of this gig. You and Fate aren't the only ones that overlap. I think it's time to see some of the perks. The door sparkled in front of us, a casino visible on the other side. She tugged me through with her. The minute we hit the floor, I heard the slot machines pick up their pace. Some of my favorites are here tonight, over by the crap tables. When we get there, you focus on the people with good karma. She tugged me along with her. I realized that we had become visible to the crowd. I can help them win? Oh, darling, you have no idea what you can help them do yet. But it's not all about them tonight. She dug out one, a, a 1,000 chip from her bra. What do I do with this? Seed money. Don't worry, you can't lose today. A little cheer went up from a group of three guys at the end of the table. There's my lady luck, one of the guys screamed. They don't know I'm actually her. They think I work in PR, she whispered as we walked over. How do you know who to help when? Me? I just help whomever I like, and I really like them. She was staring at her little group of men. Hi, boys. I want you to meet a friend of mine. She just loves to shoot dice. An hour later, we were on our third bottle of crystal. Crystal. I had a stack of chips in front of me that I couldn't even keep count of, and the casino floor was on fire. Every time I touched the dice, I rolled the point of someone with good karma at the table. Every time luck rolled, she hit one of my numbers. It got to the point that the table only had us two rolling the dice and the people were too deep trying to get bets in. The laugh was loud and the spirits were high. Annie, a single mother of two who'd been dragged, who'd been dragged here on her birthday by her sister, won enough to put both her kids through college. Al, nearly retired and here with his wife, won enough to buy their dream house. It will go down as one of the best days of their lives. And me, I realized that just maybe this wasn't the worst position in the world to be stuck in. And that's the end of chapter 30. Stay tuned for the next chapter. And welcome back. Chapter 31. I placed a fern in my carriage. A potted plant might not seem like much, but it was a big step. It meant I was staying. It would be the first mark of me in the condo that had that had up until now had up until now been a short term situation. Kitty had offered me one of her kittens. Apparently, they weren't all naturally cut out for the work. I declined. I was having a hard enough time with a plant. You might be better off with a jade. They don't need to be watered as much. I turned to see Patty holding out one, of, one to me in the middle of the garden center. I turned, making it obvious I wasn't interested in conversing with him. The guards are normally so good about secrets. The whole not talking thing usually make them perfect co-conspirators, but they like you. I get it. I like you too. His face scrunched in, in thought for a second. Or it might have been the compound. No one has ever given them a gift before. I was torn between being too furious to speak to him or wanting to beat him in between the ferns and the hostas. hostas. As much as I, I hated the idea of even acknowledging his existence, 
I'd never been good about walking away from answers. If you like me so much, then why did you do that? Why get me stuck here when you knew I wanted to leave? Because I might need you. With recruiting? Okay, I'm not exactly a recruiter. After what you did, do you really think I'd help you? I don't even know who you are. If it helps, I didn't do it just for me. You certainly didn't do what I wanted. No, and you should be grateful for that. What you want usually turn into a mess anyway. You don't know that. I've seen you do it enough. What you got is a curse and a blessing. What do you mean? You're immune to the forces more than anyone I've ever seen. Each life you led, it's gotten worse. We try and steer you left and you dig in and go right. Over and over again, fighting your path. Wrong career, always the wrong guy. I mean, I'm not saying you have to nail it exactly and get your soulmate in the first few go-rounds, but you pick the worst men for yourself. Then you screw them up too in the process because even if they aren't supposed to be with you, you sheer for, your sheer force of will railroads over them until they agree with you. Maybe I botched my relationships, but you can't say I wasn't a brilliant lawyer. Yes, I can. Half the cases you won were supposed to lose. You only won them because this thing you have, this force. I used to curse you for it. It took a while, but I eventually started to admire it a bit. Now it looks like I'm going to need it. If you wanted help, you should have asked, not tried to force it from me. I couldn't take the chance. I need you where you are. I don't care what you need. You're on your own. You'll come around. You're going to have to. Patty, what the hell are you talking about? I turned around ready to demand answers, but he was gone. I didn't know who Patty was, and I decided I didn't care. Not today. Today was about owning my own situation and making the best of things. I checked out and didn't notice I had a jade plant until I got home. And that's the end of chapter 31. Stay tuned for chapter 32. And welcome back to chapter 32, the last chapter of the book. Okay, a week had gone by since I become official. To be honest, it wasn't that bad. I was starting to find my place in the building. The jinx were teaching me the skate, teaching me to skateboard in the parking lot. Murphy bought me a fresh newspaper in with him every day. Even Harold was giving me fewer dirty looks, or maybe I was just getting used to them. It didn't matter. I was realizing I could do this. Luck had been the biggest help. Ever since the night in Vegas, I realized this job wasn't going to be all death and torture. I could make people happy. I also realized quickly that whether or not I was ready for a new best friend wasn't going to matter. She was ready and she was tenacious. Tenacious. But ever since the party, we found common ground and I really did enjoy her company. She was out there, did what made her happy and didn't care what anyone else thought. In my opinion, she was fantastic. So there I was, out with luck that Thursday night. We just finished dinner, mostly filled with chats about her current boyfriend. She had quite a few. When her eyes shot to the door, uh-oh, she said, what? Fate is here and heading straight towards our table. He's here? I hadn't seen him since the party and I knew it wasn't an accident. The time before that had been when he dropped me off at the hotel covered in blood. At this point, Fate and I were like a tricky tray of unresolved issues. What are you doing? I asked as I watched Luck grab her purse. Did you see his face? He's talking to you and there's nothing I can do. So you're just going to abandon me? Fate was at our table before she could reply. I've got to head out to Vegas. She made her eyes big when she had her back to Fate, clearly sending a signal. This should be fun. See you in a couple of days, she said and left. He stood there for a minute and we both apprised the other. 
Fate still hadn't said a word and he took Luck's chair. He stared across the table at me and I matched it. I thought not seeing him would help me, but it seemed to have only increased my awareness of him. You said you were leaving. You lied. I didn't lie. I had every intention of doing so. I sit from my half-empty martini glass. It's not over. I got my killer. I wish you and your companions luck, but for me, it's over. It's too late. You know too much, which I have no intentions of repeating. He smiled as he stood to leave, and I thought the matter was settled. But instead of walking out, he came closer, leaned down next to my chair, his mouth near my ear. You can't escape your fate. He stood and turned and walked from the room. Okay, that's the end of book one of Karma. So let's see what we have. So it says that it continues in series Jinx. Okay. Oh no. Let's see. Do it tells me the other books. Um okay. Oops, let me go back. Okay, so here we go. So this is the series of the the book. So it's Karma, Jinx, Faded, and Dead Ink. Um, I'm not going to read those books. I just wanted to read that one. So if you feel if you like this series and you want to know what happened between Karma and Fate, go for it. <laughs> but these are also books by um, Donna Augustine. Um, yeah, so I just picked this book from one of my my um, books on my Kindle, and I just chose it. And um, okay, so now what do I think about this book? Hold on. Let's see. What can I say? Um, it was kind of, I get it. I think I understand what it was about. It was all the elements in life that people go through and the reasons sometimes behind it. Um, yeah, I guess. I don't know. But yeah, I think that's what it was. But yeah, if you enjoyed this this um, reading of Karma, let me know your thoughts. Did you know what the book was about? Um, did you understand as I was reading it? Did you, um, what? Well, not did you anything, but um, will you? Will you read the next book in this series or this is it? So yeah, thank you so much, you all, for listening to me read the book Karma. Um, I guess stay tuned to see if I'm going to read another book. Talk to you all later. Bye.